Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Horror Science Fiction The Nothing Equation by Tom Godwin Träumerei by Charles Beaumont Cully by Jack Egan Dead Ringer by Lester Del Rey. They Twinkled Like Jewels by Philip Jose Farmer. The Nothing Equation by Tom Godwin, originally published in Amazing Stories, December 1957. Narrated by Tom Trisser. The cruiser vanished back into hyperspace, and he was alone in the observation bubble, ten thousand light-years beyond the galaxy's outermost sun. He looked out the windows at the gigantic sea of emptiness around him, and wondered again what the danger had been that had so terrified the men before him. Of one thing he was already certain. He would find that nothing was waiting outside the bubble to kill him. The first bubble attendant had committed suicide, and the second was a mindless maniac on the earthbound cruiser, but it must have been something inside the bubble that had caused it, or else they had imagined it all. He went across the small room, his magnetized soles loud on the thin metal floor in the bubble's silence. He sat down in the single chair, his weight very slight in the feeble artificial gravity and reviewed the known facts. The bubble was a project of Earth's Galactic Observation Bureau, positioned there to gather data from observations that could not be made from within the galaxy. Since metallic mass affected the hypersensitive instruments, the bubble had been made as small and as light as possible. It was for that reason that it could accommodate only one attendant. The Bureau had selected Horn as the bubble's first attendant, and the cruiser left him there for his six months' period of duty. When it made its scheduled return with his replacement, he was found dead from a tremendous overdose of sleeping pills. On the table was his daily report log, and its last entry made three months before. I haven't attended to the instruments for a long time, because it hates us and doesn't want us here. It hates me the most of all, and keeps trying to get into the bubble to kill me. I can hear it whenever I stop and listen, and I know it won't be long. I'm afraid of it, and I want to be asleep when it comes. But I'll have to make it soon, because I've only twenty sleeping pills left, and if... The sentence was never finished. According to the temperature recording instruments in the bubble, his body ceased radiating heat that same night. The bubble was cleaned, fumigated, and inspected inside and out. No sign of any inimical entity or force could be found. Silverman was Horn's replacement. When the cruiser returned six months later, bringing him Green to be the Silverman's replacement, Silverman was completely insane. He babbled about something that had been waiting outside the bubble to kill him, but his nearest to a rational statement was to say once, when asked for the hundredth time what he had seen. Nothing. You can't really see it, but you feel it watching you, and you hear it trying to get in to kill you. One time I bumped the wall, and, for God's sake, take me away from it, take me back to Earth. Then he had tried to hide under the captain's desk, and the ship's doctor had led him away. The bubble was minutely examined again, and the cruiser employed every detector device it possessed to search surrounding space for light years in all directions. Nothing was found. When it was time for the new replacement to be transferred to the bubble, he reported to Captain McDowell. Everything is ready, Green, McDowell said. You are the next one. His shaggy grey eyebrows met in a scowl. It would be better if they would let me select the replacement instead of them. He flushed with a touch of resentment and said, 
the Bureau found my intelligence and initiative of thought satisfactory. I know the characteristics you don't need. What they ought to have is somebody like one of my engine room roustabouts, too ignorant to get scared and too dumb to go nuts. Then we could get a sane report six months from now instead of the ravings of a maniac. I suggest, he said stiffly, that you reserve judgment until that time comes, sir. And that was all he knew about the danger, real or imaginary, that had driven two men into insanity. He would have six months in which to find the answer. Six months minus... He looked at the chronometer and saw that twenty minutes had passed since he left the cruiser. Somehow it seemed much longer. He moved to light a cigarette, and his metal soles scraped the floor with the same startling loudness he had noticed before. The bubble was so silent as a tomb. It was not much larger than a tomb, a sphere eighteen feet in diameter, made of thin sheet steel and criss-crossed outside with narrow reinforcing girders to keep the internal air pressure from rupturing it. The floor under him was six feet up from the sphere's bottom, and the space beneath held the air regenerator and waste converter units, the storage batteries and the food cabinet. The compartment in which he sat contained chair, table, a narrow cot, banks of dials, a remote control panel for operating the instruments mounted outside the hull, a microfilm projector, and a pair of exerciser springs attached to one wall. That was all. There was no means of communication, since a hyperspace communicator would have affected the delicate instruments with its radiations, but there was a small microfilm library to go with a projector, so that he should be able to pass away the time pleasantly enough. But it was not the fear of boredom that was behind the apprehension he could already feel touching at his mind. It had not been boredom that had turned Horn into a suicide and Silverman into... Something cracked sharply behind him, like a gunshot in the stillness, and he leaped to his feet, whirling to face it. It was only a metal reel of data tape that had dropped out of the spectrum and analyzer into the storage tray. His heart was thumping fast, and his attempt to laugh at his nervousness sounded hollow and mirthless. Something, inside or outside the bubble, had driven two men insane with its threat, and now that he was irrevocably exiled in the bubble himself, he could no longer dismiss their fear as products of their imagination. Both of them had been rational, intelligent men, as carefully selected by the Observation Bureau as he had been. He set in to search the bubble, overlooking nothing. When he crawled down into the lower compartment, he hesitated, then opened the longest blade of his knife before searching among the dark recesses down there. He found nothing, not even a speck of dust. Back in his chair again, he began to doubt his first conviction. Perhaps there really had been some kind of an invisible force or entity outside the bubble. Both Horn and Silverman had said that it had tried to get in to kill them. They had been very definite about that part. There were six windows around the bubble's walls, set there to enable the attendant to see all the outside mounted instruments and dials. He went to them to look out, one by one, and from all of them he saw the same vast emptiness that surrounded him. The galaxy, his galaxy, was so far away that its stars were like dust. In the other directions the empty gulf was so wide that galaxies and clusters of galaxies were tiny feeble specks of lights shining across it. All around him was a void so huge that galaxies were only specks in it. Who could know what forces or dangers might be waiting out there? A light blinked, reminding him it was time to attend to his duties. The job required an hour, and he was nervous and not yet hungry when he had finished. He went to the exerciser springs on the wall and performed a workout that left him tired and sweating, but which, at least, gave him a small appetite. 
The day passed, and the next. He made another search of the bubble's interior with the same results as before. He felt almost sure then that there was nothing in the bubble with him. He established a routine of work, pastime and sleep that made the first week pass fairly comfortably, but for the gnawing worry in his mind that something invisible was lurking just outside the windows. Then one day he accidentally kicked the wall with his metal shoe tip. It made a sound like that from kicking a tight stretched section of tin, and it seemed to him it gave a little from the impact, as tin would do. He realised for the first time how thin it was, how deadly, dangerously thin. According to the specifications he had read, it was only one sixteenth of an inch thick. It was as thin as cardboard. He sat down with pencil and paper and began calculating. The bubble had a surface area of 146,500 square inches and the internal air pressure was 14 pounds to the square inch which meant that the thin metal skin contained a total pressure of 2,051,000 pounds. 2 million pounds. The bubble in which he sat was a bomb, waiting to explode the instant any section of the thin metal weakened. It was supposed to be an alloy so extremely strong that it had a high safety factor, but he could not believe that any metal so thin could be so strong. It was all right for engineers sitting safely on earth to speak of high safety factors, but his life depended upon the fragile wall not cracking. It made a lot of difference. The next day he thought he felt the hook to which the exerciser spring was attached crack loose from where it was welded to the wall. He inspected the base of the hook closely, and there seemed to be a fine hairline fracture appearing around it. He held his ear to it, listening for any sound of a leak. It was not leaking yet, but it could commence doing so at any time. He looked out the windows at the illimitable void that was waiting to absorb his pitiful little supply of air, and he thought of the days he had hauled and jerked at the springs with all his strength, not realising the damage he was doing. There was a sick feeling in his stomach for the rest of the day, and returned again and again to examine the hairline around the hook. The next day he discovered an even more serious threat. The thin skin of the bubble had been spot welded to the outside reinforcing girders. Such welding often created hard brittle spots that would soon crystallise from continued movement, and there was a slight temperature difference in the bubble between its working and sleeping hours that would daily produce a contraction and expansion of the skin especially when he used the little cooking burner. He quit using the burner for any purpose and began a daily inspection of every square inch of the bubble's walls, marking with white chalk all the welding spots that appeared to be definitely weakened. Each day he found more to mark, and soon the little white circles were scattered across the walls wherever he looked. When he was not working at examining the walls, he could feel the windows watching him, like staring eyes. Out of self-defence he would have to go to them and stare back at the emptiness. Space was alien, coldly deadly alien. He was a tiny spark of life in a hostile sea of nothing, and there was no one to help him. The nothing outside was waiting day and night for the most infinitesimal, leak or crack in the walls. The nothing that had been waiting out there since time without beginning, and would wait for time without end. Sometimes he would touch his finger to the wall and think, death is out there, only one sixteenth of an inch away. His first fears became a black and terrible conviction. The bubble could not continue to resist the attack for long. It had already lasted longer than it should have. Two million pounds of pressure wanted out, and all the sucking, nothing of intergalactic space wanted in. And only a thin skin of metal, rotten with brittle welding spots, stood between them. 
it wanted in, the nothing wanted in. He knew then that Horn and Silverman had not been insane. It wanted in, and some day it would get in. When it did, it would explode him and jerk out his guts and lungs. Not until that happened, not until the nothing filled the bubble and enclosed his hideous, turned inside-out body, would it ever be content. He had long since quit wearing the magnetized shoes, afraid the vibration of them would weaken the bubble still more. And he began noticing sections where the bubble did not seem to be perfectly concave, as though the rolling mill had pressed the metal too thin in places, and it was swelling out like an overinflated balloon. He could not remember when he had last attended to the instruments. Nothing was important but the danger that surrounded him. He knew the danger was rapidly increasing, because whenever he pressed his ear to the wall, he could hear the almost inaudible tickings and vibrations as the bubble's skin contracted or expanded, and the nothing tapped and searched with its empty fingers for a flaw or crack that it could tear into a leak. But the windows were far the worst, with the nothing staring in at him day and night. There was no escape from it. He could feel it watching him, malignant and gloating, even when he hid his eyes in his hands. The time came when he could stand it no longer. The cot had a blanket, and he used that together with all his spare clothes to make a tent stretching from the table to the first instrument panel. When he crawled under it, he found that the lower half of one window could still see him. He used the clothes he was wearing to finish the job, and was much better than hiding there in the concealing darkness where the nothing could not see him. He did not mind going naked. The temperature regulators in the bubble never let it get too cold. He had no conception of time from then on. He emerged only when necessary to bring more food into his tent. He could still hear the nothing tapping and sucking in its ceaseless search for a floor, and he made such emergencies as brief as possible, wishing that he did not have to come out at all. Maybe if he could hide in his tent for a long time and never make a sound, it would get tired and go away. Sometimes he thought of the cruiser and wished they would come for him, but most of the time he thought of the thing that was outside trying to get in to kill him. When the strain became too great, he would draw himself up in the position he had once occupied in his mother's womb and pretend he had never left earth. It was easier there. But always before very long, the bubble would tick or whisper, and he would freeze in terror, thinking, this time it's coming in. Then one day, suddenly, two men were peering under his tent at him. One of them said, My God, again! And he wondered what he meant. But they were very nice to him, and helped him put on his clothes. Later, in the cruiser, Everything was hazy, and they kept asking him what he was afraid of. What was it? What did you find? He tried hard to think so he could explain it. It was... it was nothing. What were you and Horn and Silverman afraid of? What was it? the voice demanded insistently. I told you, he said. Nothing. They stared at him, and the haziness cleared a little as he saw they did not understand. He wanted them to believe him, because what he told them was so very true. It wanted to kill us. Please, can't you believe me? It was waiting outside the bubble to kill us. But they kept staring, and he knew they didn't believe him. They didn't want to believe him. Everything turned hazy again, and he started to cry. He was glad when the doctor took his hand to lead him away. The bubble was carefully inspected, inside and out, and nothing was found. When it was time for Green's replacement to be transferred to it, Larkin reported to Captain McDowell. Everything is ready, Larkin, McDowell said. You're the next one. I wish we knew what the danger is, 
he scowled. I still think one of my roustabouts from the engine room might give us a sane report six months from now instead of the babblings we'll get from you. He felt his face flush, and he said stiffly, I suggest, sir, that you do not jump to conclusions until that time comes. The cruiser vanished back into hyperspace, and he was alone inside the observation bubble, ten thousand light years beyond the galaxy's outermost sun. He looked out the windows at the gigantic sea of emptiness around him, and wondered again what the danger had been that had so terrified the men before him. Of one thing he was already certain. He would find that nothing was waiting outside the bubble to kill him. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Traumerei by Charles Beaumont Originally published in Infinity Science Fiction, February 1956 Narrated by Tom Trissel At the sound, Henry Ritchie's hand jerked. Most of the martini sloshed out over his robe. He jumped up, swabbing furiously at the spots. God damn it! Hank! His wife slammed her book together. Well, what do you expect? That confounded buzzer! He's a perfectly natural, normal buzzer. You're just terribly upset, dear. No, Mr. Ritchie said. I am not just terribly upset, dear. For seven years I've been listening to that banshee's wail every time somebody wants in. Well, I'm through. Either it goes... All right, all right, Mrs. Ritchie said. You don't have to make a production out of it. Well? Well, what? Mr. Ritchie sighed ponderously, glared at his wife set what was left of the martini down on the table, and went to the door. He slipped the chain. "'Be this the master of halfway house?' Mr. Ritchie opened the door. "'Max, what the devil are you doing up at this hour?' A large man, well-built in his forties, walked in, smiling. "'I could ask you the same question,' he said, flinging his hat and scarf in the direction of a chair. "'But I'm far too thoughtful.' They went back into the living room. Mrs. Ritchie looked up, frowned. "'Oh, swell,' she said. "'Dandy. All we need now is a bridge for.' "'Ruth's just terribly upset,' Mr. Ritchie said. "'Well,' the large man said, "'it is nice to see unanimity in this house for once anyway. "'Hi, Ruth.' He walked over to the bar and found the martini mix and drained the jar's contents into a glass. Then he drained the glass. "'Hey, take it easy.' Max Kaplan turned to face his hosts. He looked quite a bit older than usual. The grin wasn't boyish now. "'Dear folkses,' he said, "'when I die, I don't want to see any fool bottles around.' "'Oh, ha-ha, that's just so very deliriously funny,' Mrs. Ritchie said. She was massaging her temples. "'I'm glad to see her ladyship amused,' Kaplan followed Mr. Ritchie's gaze. "'Hickory dickory dock, the mice looked at the clock.' Oh, shut up. Oops, sorry. The big man mixed up a new batch silently, then refilled the three glasses. He sat down. The clock's tick, a deep, sharp bass sound, got louder and louder in the room. Kaplan rested his head on the couch arm. Less than an hour, he said. Not even an hour. I knew it, Mrs. Ritchie stood up. I knew it the minute you walked in. We're not nervous enough. Oh, no. Now we've got to listen to the great city editor and his news behind the news. Very well. Kaplan rose shakily. He was drunk, it showed now. If I'm not welcome here, then I shall go elsewhere to breathe my last. Never mind, Mrs. Ritchie said. Sit down. I've had a stomach full of this wake. If you two insist on sitting up until X hour like a couple of ghouls, well, that's your business. I'm going to bed and to sleep. "'What a woman!' Kaplan muttered, polishing off the martini. "'Nerves of chilled steel!' Mrs. Ritchie looked at her husband for a moment. Then she said, "'Good night, dear,' and started for the door. "'See you in the morning,' Mr. Ritchie said. "'Get a good sleep.' Then Max Kaplan giggled. "'Yeah, a real good sleep.' Mrs. Ritchie left the room. The big man fumbled for a cigarette. 
He glanced at the clock. Hank, for Christ's sake. Henry Ritchie sighed and slumped in the chair. I tried, Max. Did you? Did you try? I mean, with everything. With everything. Might as well face it. The boy's going to burn. Right on schedule. Kaplan opened his mouth. Forget it. The governor isn't about to issue a commutation. With the public's blood up the way it is, he knows what it would mean to his vote. We were stupid even to try. Lousy vultures. Ritchie shrugged. They're hungry, Max. You forget, there hasn't been an execution in this state for over two years. They're hungry. So a poor dumb kid's got to fry alive in order for them to get their kicks. Wait a second now. Don't get carried away. The same poor dumb kid is the boy who killed George Sanderson in cold blood and then raped his wife, not too very long ago. If I recall, your word for him was brutal murderer. That was the paper. This is you and me. Well, get that accusatory look off your face. Murder and rape. Those are stiff raps to beat, pal. You did it with Beatty. You got him off, Kaplan reminded his friend. Luck. Public mood. Beatty was an old man. Feeble. Look, Max, why don't you stop beating around the bush? OK, Kaplan said slowly. They let me in this afternoon. I talked with him again. Ritchie nodded. And? Hank, I'm telling you, it gives me the creeps. I swear it does. What did he tell you? Kaplan puffed on his cigarette nervously, kept his eyes on the clock. He was lying down when I went in, curled up tight, trying to sleep. Go on. When he heard me, he came too. Mr. Kaplan, he says, you've got to make them believe me. You've got to make them understand. His eyes got real big then, and... Hank, I'm scared. Of what? I don't know, just him, maybe. I'm not sure. He carrying the same line. Yeah, but worse this time, more intense somehow. Richie tried to keep the smile. He remembered all right. Much too well. The whole story was crazy. Normally enough to get the kid off with a life sentence in the criminally insane ward. But it was a little too crazy, so the psychiatrist wouldn't buy. Can't get his words out of my mind, Kaplan was saying. His eyes were closed. Mister, tell them, tell them. If you kill me, then you'll all die. The whole world of yours will die. Because, Ritchie remembered, you don't exist, any of you, except in my mind. Don't you see? I'm asleep and dreaming all this. You, your wives, your children. It's all part of my dream. And when you kill me, then I'll wake up and that will be the end of you. Well, Ritchie said, it's original. Kaplan shook his head. Come on, Max, snap out of it. You act like you've never listened to a lunatic before. People have been predicting the end of the world ever since year one. Sure, I know. You don't have to patronise me. It's just that, well, who is this particular lunatic anyway? We don't know any more about him than the day he was caught, even the name we had to make up. Who is he? Where did he come from? What's his home? My home, a world of eternities, an eternity of worlds. I must destroy, hurt, kill before I wake always, and then once more I must sleep, always, always. Look, there's a hundred vagrants in every city, just like our boy, no name, no friends, no relatives. Then it doesn't seem in the least odd to you, is that it? Is that what you're telling me? So he's odd. I've never met a murderer that wasn't. Richie recalled the lean, hairless face, the expressionless eyes, the slender, youthful body that moved in strange, hesitant jerks, the halting voice. The clock bonged the quarter hour, fifteen to twelve. Max Kaplan wiped the perspiration from his forehead. And besides, Richie said, somewhat too loudly, it's plain ridiculous. He says, what? We're a dream he's having, right? Okay, then what about our parents? and their parents, everybody who never heard of the kid. First thing I thought of, and you know his answer. Richie snorted. Well, think it over, for God's sake. He says every dream is a complete unit in itself. You, haven't you ever had nightmares about people you've never seen before? Yeah, I suppose so, but... All right, even though they were projections of your subconscious, or whatever the hell it's called, 
They were complete, weren't they? Going somewhere, doing something, all on their own. Richie was silent. Where were they going? What were they doing? See, the kid says every dream, even ours, builds its own whole world, complete with a past, and as long as you stay asleep, a future. Nonsense! What about us, when we sleep and dream? Or is the period when we're unconscious the time he's up and around? And keep in mind that everybody doesn't sleep at the same time. You're missing the point, Hank. I said it was complete, didn't I? And isn't sleeping part of the pattern? Have another drink, Max. You're slipping. What will you wake up to? My home. You would not understand. Then what? Then I sleep again and dream another world. Why did you kill George Sanderson? It is my eternal destiny to kill and suffer punishment. Why? Why? In my world I committed a crime. It is the punishment of my world, this destiny. Then try this on for size, Richie said. That kid's frozen stiff with fear. Since he's going to have to wake up no matter what, then why not sit back and enjoy it? Kaplan's eyes widened. Hank, how soundly do you sleep? What's that got to do with it? I mean, do you ever dream? Of course. Ever get hold of any particularly vivid ones? Falling downstairs like, being tortured, anything like that? Richie pulled at his drink. Sure you have, Kaplan gazed steadily at the clock. Almost midnight. Then try to remember, in that kind of dream, isn't it true that the pleasure or pain you feel is almost as real as if you were actually experiencing it? I remember once I had a nightmare about my old man. He caught me in the basement with a cigarette. I was eight or nine, I guess. He took down my pants and started after me with his belt. Hank, that hurt. Bad. It really hurt. So what's the point? In my dream I tried to get away from my old man. He chased me all over that basement. Well, it's the same with the kid, except his dream is a hundred times more vivid. That's all. He knows he'll feel that electric chair, feel the jolts frying into him, feel the death boiling up in his throat just as much as if he was honest to God sitting there. Kaplan stopped talking. The two men sat quietly watching the clock's invisible progress. Then Richie leaped up and stalked over to the bar again. Dog on you, Max, he called. You're getting me fidgety now. Don't kid me, Kaplan said. You've been fidgeting on, on your own for quite a while. I don't know how you ever made the grade as a criminal lawyer. You don't know the first thing about lying. Richie didn't answer. He poured the drink slowly. Look at you and Ruth, screaming at each other. And then there was the other tip-off. The way you defended the kid. Brilliantly. Masterfully. You'd never have done that for a common open-and-shut little killer. Max, Richie said. You're nuts. Tell you what, at exactly 12.01, I'll take you out for the biggest, juiciest, rarest steak you ever saw. On me. Then we'll get loaded and fall all over ourselves laughing. Richie fought away the sudden picture of steak, rare steak, with the blood sputtering out, sizzling on an electric stove. The clock began to strike. Henry Ritchie and Max Kaplan stood very still. He uncoiled. The dry pop of hardened joints jabbed wakefulness into him until finally the twenty-foot-long shell lay straight upon the steaming rocks. He opened his eyes, all of them, one by one. Across the bubbling pools, far away, past the white stone geysers, he could see them coming many of them, swiftly, giant slithering things with many arms and many legs. He tried to move, but rock grew over him and he could not move. By looking around he could see the cliff's edge and he remembered the thousand bottomless pits below. Gradually the rest formed and he remembered all. He turned to the largest creature. Did you tell them? He knew this would be a horrible punishment, worse than the last, the burning far worse. Fingers began to unhinge the thick shell, peel it from him, leaving the viscous white tenderness bare to the heat and pain. 
Tell them. Make them understand. This is only a dream I'm having. They took the prisoner to the precipice, lingered a moment to give him a view of the dizziness and the sucking things far below. The nervous hands pressed him forward into space. He did not wake for a long time. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Cully by Jack Egan Originally published in Amazing Stories, January 1963 Narrated by Tom Trussell Above him, eighty feet of torpid black water hung like a shroud of death, and still he heard his ragged breathing, and something else. Cully concentrated on that sound and the rhythmic pulsing of his heart. Somehow he had to retain a hold on his sanity, or his soul. After an hour of careful breathing and exploring of body sensations, Cully realised he could move. He flexed an arm, a moat of gold sand sifted upwards in the dark water. It had a pleasant colour, in contrast with the ominous shades of the sea. In a few moments he had struggled to a sitting position, delighting in the curtain of glittering metal grains whirling about him as he moved. And the other sound, a humming in his mind, a distant burble of tiny voices of other minds, words swirling in giddy patterns he couldn't understand. Shortly thereafter, Cully discovered why he still lived, breathed, a suit, a yellow plastic watertight suit with an orange on black shield on the left breast pocket and a clear bubble helmet. He felt a weight on his back and examined it, two air tanks and their regulator, a radio, and the box. Suit, tanks, regulator, radio, black water, box, sand, sea, stillness. Cully considered his world. It was small. It was conceivable. It was incomplete. Where is it? Where is what? He knew he had a voice, a means of communication between others of his kind, using low-frequency heat waves caused by agitation of air molecules. Why couldn't he make it work? Words, thousands of them, at his beck and call. What were they? What did they mean? He shifted uncomfortably in the tight yellow suit, searching the near horizon for... Where is it? A vague calling came from beyond the Black Sea Curtain. Objectively, because he could do nothing to stop them, he watched his feet pick up, move forward, put down, pick up, move forward, put down. Funny. He had the feeling, the concept, that this action held meaning. It was supposed to cause some reaction, accomplish an act. He wondered at the regular movement of his legs. One of them hurt. A hurt is a sensation of pain caused by overloading sensory units in the body. A hurt is bad because it indicates something is wrong. Something certainly was wrong. Something stirred in Cully's mind. He stopped and sat down on the sandy sea bottom gracefully like a ballet dancer. He examined his foot. There was a tiny hole in the yellow plastic fabric and a thin string of red-black was oozing out. Blood. He knew. He was bleeding. He could do nothing about it. He got up and resumed walking. Where is it? Cully lifted his head in annoyance at the sharp thought. Go away, he said in a low, pleading voice. The sound made him feel better. He began muttering to himself. Water, black, sand, hurt, pain, radio tanks. It didn't sound right. After a few minutes he was quiet. The many thoughts were calling him. 
he must go to the many thoughts. If his foot was bleeding, then something had happened. If something had happened, then his foot was bleeding. No. If something had happened, then maybe other things had happened before that. But how could something happen in a word of flat gold sand and flaccid sea? Surely there was something wrong. Wrong, the state of being not right. Something had happened that was not right. Cully stared at the edges of the unmoving curtain before him. Where is it? It was a driving, promise-filled concept. No words, just the sense that something wonderful lay just beyond reach. But this voice was different from the many thoughts. It was directing his body. His mind was along for the ride. The sameness of the sea and sand became unbearable. It was too right, somehow. Cully felt anger and kicked up eddies of dust. It changed the sameness a little. He kicked more up until it swirled around him in a thick gold haze, blotting out the terrible emptiness of the sea. He felt another weight at his side. He found a holster and gun. He recognised neither. Again he watched objectively as his hand pulled the black object out and handled it. His body was evidently familiar with it, though it was strange to his eyes. His finger slipped automatically into the trigger sheaf. His legs were still working under two drives, the many thoughts urging, and something else buried in him, a longing, up and down, back and forth. Where is it? Anger, frustration flared in him. His hand shot out, gun at ready. He turned around slowly. Through the settling trail of suspended sand, nothing was visible. Again he was moving. Something made his legs move. He walked on through the shrouds of death until he felt a taut singing in his nerves. An irrational fear sprang out in him, cascading down his spine, and Cully shuddered. Ahead there was some thing. Two motives. Get there because it, they, calls. Get there because you must. Where is it? The mind voice was excited, demanding. Something was out there, besides the sameness. Cully walked on, trailing gold. The death curtain parted. An undulating garden of blue and gold streamers suddenly drifted toward him on an unfelt current. Cully was held, entranced. They flowed before him, their colours dazzling, hypnotic. Come closer, earthling, the many thoughts spoke inside his head, soothingly. Here it is, Cully's mind shouted. Cully's mind was held, hypnotised, but his body moved of its own volition. He moved again, his mind and the many thoughts spoke. Fulfilment, almost. There was one action left that must be completed. Cully's arms moved. They detached the small black box from his pack. He moved on into the midst of the weaving gold-laced plants. Little spikules licked out from their flexing stalks and jabbed, unsensed, into Cully's body to draw nourishment. From the many thoughts came the sense of complete fulfilment. From Cully's mind came further orders. Lie down! It was a collective concept. Lie still! We are friends! He could not understand. They were speaking words. Words were beyond him. His head shook in despair. The voices were implanting an emotion of horror at what his hands were doing, but he had no control over his body. It was as if it were not his. The black box was now lying in the sand among the streaming plants. Cully's fingers reached out and caressed a small panel. A soundless click ran through the murkiness. The strangely beautiful, gold-laced, blue plants began a writhing dance. The spikules withdrew and jabbed, withdrew and jabbed. A rending, silent scream tore the quiet waters. 
No! they cried. It was a negative command, mixed in with a terrible screaming, Turn it off! Stop it! Stop it! Cully tried to say, but there were no words. He tried to cover his ears within the helmet, but the cries went on. Emotions roiled the water, pain, hurt, reproach. Cully sobbed. Something was wrong here. Something was killing the plants, the beautiful blue things. The plants were withering, dying. He looked up at them, stupefied, not understanding, tears streaming down his face. What do they want from him? What had he done? Where is it? A different direction materialised, a new concept of desire. Cully's body turned and crawled away from the wonderful dying garden, oblivious to the pleadings floating now weakly in the torpid water. He scuffed up little motes of golden sand, leaving a low-lying scud along the bottom, back to the little black box in the garden. The plants, the box, all were forgotten by now. Cully crawled on, not knowing why. A rise appeared. Surprise caught Cully unaware. A change in the sameness. Where is it? Again the voice was insistent. His desire was close ahead. He did not look back at the black churning on the sea bottom. His legs worked. His chest heaved. Words swirled in his mind. He topped the rise. Below him, in the centre of a shallow golden bowl, floated a long, shiny cylinder. Even from here he knew it was huge. He knew other things about it, how heavy it was, how it was, that it carried others of his kind. He had been in it before, and they were waiting for him. He lurched on. Captain, here comes Cully, the midshipman shouted from the airlock. Look what they've done to him. The old man's grey eyes took in the spectacle without visible emotion. He watched the pathetic, bleeding, yellow plastic sack crawl up to the ship and look up. His hands reached down and lifted Cully up into the lock. They took his suit off and stared with the loathing at what had once been a man. A white scar zigzagged across his forehead. The captain bent close in range of the dim blue eyes. It was a brave thing you did, Cully. The whole system will be grateful. Venus could never be colonised as long as those cannibals were there to eat men and drive men mad. Cully fingered the scar on his forehead and looked unseeing into the old man's compassionate eyes. I'm sorry, Cully. We all are. But there was no other way prefrontal lobotomy, destruction of your speech centre. It was the only way you could get past the telepaths and destroy them. I'm sorry, Cully. The race of man shall long honour your name. Cully smiled at the old man, the words churning in his brain, but he did not understand. Where is it? The emptiness was still there. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Dead Ringer by Lester Del Rey Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, November 1956 Narrated by Tom Trussell There was nothing, especially on Earth, which could set him free the truth least of all. Dane Phillips slouched in the window seat, watching the morning crowds on their way to work and carefully avoiding any attempt to read Jordan's old face as the editor skimmed through the notes. He had learned to make his tall, bony body seem all loose-jointed relaxation, no matter what he felt. But the oversized hands in his pockets were clenched so tightly that the nails were cutting into his palms. Every tick of the old-fashioned clock sent a throb racing through his brain. Every rustle of the pages seemed to release a fresh shot of adrenaline into his bloodstream. This time 
his mind was pleading. It has to be right this time. Jordan finished his reading and shoved the folder back. He reached for his pipe, sighed, and then nodded slowly. A nice job of researching Phillips, and it might make a good feature for the Sunday section at that. It took a second to realise that the words meant acceptance, for Phillips had prepared himself too thoroughly against another failure. Now he felt the tautened muscles release, so quickly that it would have fallen if he hadn't been braced against the seat. He groped in his mind, hunting for words and finding none. There was only the hot, sudden flame of unbelieving hope, and then an almost blinding exultation. Jordan didn't seem to notice the silence. The editor made a neat pile of the notes, nodding again. Sure, I like it. We've been short of shock stuff lately, and the readers go for it when we can get a fresh angle. But naturally, you'd have to leave out all that nonsense on blanding. Hell, the man's just buried, and his relatives and friend. But that's the proof! Phillips stared at the editor, trying to penetrate through the haze of hope that had somehow grown chilled and unreal. His thoughts were abruptly disorganised and out of his control. Only the urgency remained. It's the key evidence, and we've got to move fast. I don't know how long it takes, but even one more day may be too late. Jordan nearly dropped the pipe from his lips as he jerked upright to peer sharply at the younger man. Are you crazy? Do you seriously expect me to get an order to exhume him now? What would it get us other than lawsuits, even if we could get the order without cause, which we can't? Then the pipe did fall as he gaped open-mouthed. My God, you believe all that stuff! You expected us to publish it straight! No, Dane said thickly. The hope was gone now, as if it had never existed, leaving a numb emptiness where nothing mattered. No. I guess I didn't really expect anything. But I believe the facts. Why shouldn't I? He reached for the papers with hands he could hardly control, and began stuffing them back into the folder. All the careful documentation, the fingerprints, smudged perhaps in some cases, but still evidence enough for anyone but a fool. Phillips, Jordan said questioning to himself, and his voice was taking on a new edge. Phillips, wait a minute. I've got it now. Dane Phillips, not Arthur. Two years on the Trib. Then you turned up on the register in Seattle. Philip Dean, or some such name there. Yeah, Dane agreed. There was no use in denying anything now. Yeah, Dane Arthur Phillips. So I suppose I'm through here. Jordan nodded again, and there was a faint look of fear in his expression. You can pick up your pay on the way out and make it quick before I change my mind and call the boys in white. It could have been worse. It had been worse before. And there was enough in the pay envelope to buy what he needed. A flash camera, a little folding shovel from one of the surplus houses, and a bottle of good scotch. It would be dark enough for him to taxi out to Oak Haven Cemetery, where Blanding had been buried. It wouldn't change the minds of the fools, of course. Even if he could drag back what he might find, without the change being completed, they wouldn't accept the evidence. He'd been crazy to think anything could change their minds. And they called him a fanatic. If the facts he'd dug up in the ten years of hunting wouldn't convince them, nothing would. And yet he had to see for himself before it was too late. He picked a cheap hotel at random and checked in under an assumed name. He couldn't go back to his room while there was a chance that Jordan might still not try to turn him in. There wouldn't be time for Sylvia's detectives to bother him, probably, but there was the ever-present danger that one of the aliens might intercept the message. He shivered. He'd been risking that for ten years, yet the likelihood was still a horror to him. The uncertainty made it harder to take than any human-devised torture could be. There was no way of guessing what an alien might do to anyone who discovered that all men were not human, that some were zombies. There was the classic syllogism, all men are mortal, I am a man, therefore I am mortal. But not Blanding, or Corporal Harding. It was Harding's death that had started it all during the fighting on Guadalcanal. A grenade had come flying into the foxhole where Dane and Harding had felt reasonably safe. The concussion had knocked Dane out, 
possibly saving his life when the enemy thought he was dead. He'd come to in the daylight to see Harding lying there, mangled and twisted, with his throat torn. There was blood on Dane's uniform, obviously splattered from the dead man. It hadn't been a mistake or delusion. Harding had been dead. It had taken Dane two days of crawling and hiding to get back to his group, to it too exhausted to report Harding's death. He'd slept for twenty hours, and when he awoke, Harding had been standing beside him, with a whole throat and a fresh uniform, grinning and kidding him for running off and leaving a stunned friend behind. He was no ringer, but Harding himself, complete to the smallest personal memories and personality traits. The pressures of war probably saved Dane's sanity when he learned to face the facts. All men are mortal. Harding is not mortal. Therefore, Harding is not a man. Nor was Harding alone. Dane found enough evidence to know there were others. The Tribune morgue yielded even more data. A man had faced seven firing squads and walked away. Another survived over a dozen attacks by professional killers. Fingerprints turned up mysteriously copied from those of men long dead. Some of the aliens seemed to heal almost instantly. Others took days. Some operated completely alone. Some seemed to have joined with others. But they were legion. Lack of a clearer pattern of attack made him consider the possibility of human mutation. But such tissue was too wildly different, and the invasion had begun long before atomics or X-rays. He gave up trying to understand their alien motivations. It was enough that they existed in secret, slowly growing in numbers while mankind was unaware of them. When his proof was complete and irrefutable, he took it to his editor, to be fired politely but coldly. Other editors were less polite, but he went on doggedly trying and failing. What else could he do? Somehow, he had to find the few people who could recognise facts and warn them. The aliens would get him, of course, when the story broke, but a warned humanity could cope with them. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then he met Sylvia by accident after losing his fifth job, a girl who had inherited a fortune big enough to spread his message in paid ads across the country. They were married before he found she was hard-headed about her money, she demanded a full explanation for every cent beyond his allowance. In the end, she got the explanation, and while he was trying to cash the cheque she gave him, she visited Dr. Buell to come back with a squad of quiet, refined, strong-arm boys who made sure Dane reached Buell's rest home safely. Hydrotherapy. Buell as the kindly, firm father image. Analysis. Hypnosis that stripped every secret from him including his worst childhood nightmare. His father had committed a violent, bloody suicide after one of the many quarrels with Dane's mother. Dane had found the body. Two nights after the funeral, he had dreamed of his father's face, horror-filled at the window. He knew now that it was a normal nightmare, caused by being forced to look at the face in the coffin. But the shock had lasted for years, it had bothered him again after his discovery of the aliens, until a thorough check had proved without doubt that his father had been fully human with a human, if tempestuous, childhood behind him. Dr. Buell was delighted. You see, Dane, you know it was a nightmare, but you don't really believe it even now. Your father was an alien monster to you. No adult is quite human to a child. And that literal mind itself, your subconscious, saw him after he died. So there are alien monsters who return from death. Then you come too from a concussion. Harding is sprawled out unconscious, covered with blood. Probably your blood, Sidney, you say he wasn't wounded later. But after seeing your father, you can't associate blood with yourself. You see it as a horrible wound on Harding. When he turns out to be alive, you're still in partial shock with your subconscious dominant. And that has the answer already. There are monsters who come back from the dead. An exaggerated reaction, but nothing really abnormal. We'll have you out of here in no time. No non-directive psychiatry for Buell. The man beamed paternally, chuckling as he added what he must have considered the clincher. Anyhow, 
Even zombies can't stand fire, Dane, so we can stop worrying about Harding. I checked up on him. He was burned to a crisp in a hotel fire two months ago. It was logical enough to shake Dane's faith, until he came across Milo Blanding's picture in a magazine article on society in St. Louis. According to the item, Milo was a cousin of the Blandings, whose father had vanished in Chile as a young man, and who had just rejoined the family. The picture was of Harding. An alien could have gotten away by simply committing suicide and being carried from the rest home. But Dane had to do it the hard way, watching his chance and using commando tactics on a guard who had come to accept him as a harmless nut. In St. Louis, he'd used the purloined letter technique to hide, going back to newspaper work and using almost his real name. It had seemed to work, too, but he'd been less lucky about Harding Blanding. The man had been in Europe on some kind of a tour until his return only this last week. Dane had seen him just once then, but long enough to be sure it was Harding, before he died again. This time it was in a drunken auto accident that seemed to be none of his fault, but left his body a mangled wreck. It was almost dark when Dane dismissed the taxi at the false address, a mile from the entrance to the cemetery. He watched it turn back down the road, then picked up the valise with his camera and folding shovel. He shivered as he moved reluctantly ahead. War had proved that he would never be a brave man, and the old fears of darkness and graveyards were still strong in him. But he had to know what the coffin contained now, if it wasn't already too late. It represented the missing link in his picture of the aliens. What happened to them during the period of regrowth? Did they revert to their natural form? Were they at all conscious while the body reshaped itself into wholeness? Dane had puzzled over it night after night with no answer. Nor could he figure how they could escape from the grave. Perhaps a man could force his way out of some of the coffins he had inspected. The soil would still be soft and loose in the grave, and a lot of the coffins and the boxes around them were strong in appearances only. A determined creature that could exist without much air for long enough might make it, but there were other caskets that couldn't be cracked, at least without the aid of outside help. What happened when a creature that could survive even the poison of embalming fluids and the draining of all the blood woke up in such a coffin? Dane's mind skittered from it, as always, and then came back to it reluctantly. There were still accounts of corpses turned up with the nails and hair grown long in the grave. Could normal tissues stand the current tricks of the morticians to have life enough for such growth? The possibility was absurd. Those cases had to be aliens, ones who hadn't escaped. Even they must die eventually in such a case, after weeks and months. It took time for hair to grow. And there were stories of corpses that had apparently fought and twisted in their coffins still. What was it like for an alien then, going slowly mad while it waited for true death? How long did madness take? He shivered again, but went steadily on while the cemetery fence appeared in the distance. He'd seen Blanding's coffin and the big solid metal casket around it that couldn't be cracked by any amount of effort and strength. He was sure the creature was still there, unless it had a confederate. But that wouldn't matter. An empty coffin would also be proof. Dane avoided the main gate, unsure about whether there would be a watchman or not. A hundred feet away, there was a tree near the ornamental spikes of the iron fence. He threw his bag over and began shinnying up. It was difficult, but he made it finally, dropping onto the soft grass beyond. There was the trace of the moon at times through the clouds, but it hadn't betrayed him, and there had been no alarm wire along the top of the fence. He moved from shadow to shadow, his hair prickling along the base of his neck. Locating the right grave in the darkness was harder than he had expected, even with an occasional brief use of the small flashlight. But at last he found the marker that was serving until the regular monument could arrive. His hands were sweating so much that it was hard to use the small shovel, but the digging of foxholes had given him experience, and the ground was still soft from the gravedigger's work. He stopped once as the moon came out briefly, 
Again, a sound in the darkness above left him hovering and sick in the hole. But it must have been only some animal. He uncovered the top of the casket with hands already blistering. Then he cursed as he realised the catches were near the bottom, making his work even harder. He reached them at last, fumbling them open. The metal top of the casket seemed to be a dome of solid lead, and he had no room to manoeuvre, but it began swinging up reluctantly until he could feel the polished wood of the coffin. Dane reached for the lid with hands he could barely control. Fear was thick in his throat now. What could an alien do to a man who discovered it? Would it be Harding there, or some monstrous thing still changing? How long did it take a revived monster to go mad when it found no way to escape? He gripped the shovel in one hand, working out the lid with the other. Now, abruptly, his nerves steadied, as they had done whenever he was in real battle. He swung the lid up and began groping for the camera. His hand went into the silk-lined interior and found nothing. It was too late. Either Hardy had gotten out somehow before the final ceremony, or a confederate had already been there. The coffin was empty. There were no warning sounds this time, only hands that slipped under his arms and across his mouth, lifting him easily from the grave. A match flared briefly, and it was looking into the face of Buell's chief strong-arm man. "'Hello, Mr. Phillips. Promise to be quiet and we'll release you, OK?' At Dane's sickened nod, he gestured to the others. "'Let him go. And Tom, better get that filled in. We don't want any trouble from this.' Surprise came from the grave a moment later. Hey, Burke, there's no corpse here. Burke's words killed any hopes Dane had at once. So what? Ever hear a cremation? Lots of people use a regular coffin for the ashes. He wasn't cremated, Dane told him. You can check up on that. But he knew it was useless. Sure, Mr. Phillips, we'll do that. The tone was one reserved for humouring madmen. Burke turned, gesturing. "'Better come along, Mr. Phillips. Your wife and Dr. Buell are waiting at the hotel.' The gate was open now, but there was no sign of a watchman. If one worked here, Sylvia's money would have taken care of that, of course. Dane went along quietly, sitting in the rubble of his hopes while the big car purred through the morning and on down Liddell Boulevard toward the hotel. Once he shivered, and Burke dug out hot, brandied coffee. They had thought of everything, including a coat to cover his dirt-soiled clothes as they took him up the elevator to where Buell and Sylvia were waiting for him. She had been crying, obviously, but there were no tears or recriminations when she came over to kiss him. Funny, she must still love him, as he'd learned to his surprise he loved her, under different circumstances. "'So you found me?' he asked needlessly of Buell. He was operating on purely automatic habits now, the reaction from the night and his failure numbing him emotionally. "'Jordan got in touch with you?' Buell smiled back at him. "'We knew where you were all along, Dane, but as long as you acted normal, we hoped it might be better than the home. Too bad we couldn't stop you before you got all mixed up in this.' "'So I suppose I'm committed to your booby-hatch again?' Buell nodded, refusing to resent the term. "'I'm afraid so, Dane, for a while, anyhow. "'You'll find your clothes in that room. "'Why don't you clean up a little? "'Take a hot bath, maybe. "'You'll feel better.' "'Dane went in, surprised when no guards followed him. "'But they had thought of everything. "'What looked like a screen on the window "'had been re-recently installed and was strong enough to prevent his escape.' Blessed are the poor, for they shall be poorly guarded. He was turning on the shower when he heard the sound of voices coming through the door. He left the water running and came back to listen. Sylvia speaking. Seems so logical, so completely rational. It makes him a dangerous person, Buell answered, and there was no false warmth in his voice now. Sylvia, you've got to admit it to yourself. All the reason and analysis in the world won't convince him he's wrong. This time we'll have to use shock treatment. 
burn over those memories, fade them out, is the only possible course. There was a pause and then a sigh. I suppose you're right. Dane didn't want to hear more. He drew back while his mind fought to accept the hideous reality. Shock treatment. The works, if what he knew of psychiatry was correct. Enough of it to erase his memories, a part of himself. It wasn't therapy Buell was considering. It couldn't be. It was the answer of an alien that had a human in its hands, one who knew too much. He might have guessed what better place for an alien than in the guise of a psychiatrist. Where else was there a chance for all the refined modern torture needed to burn out a man's mind? Dane had spent ten years in fear of being discovered by them, and now Buell had him. Sylvia? He couldn't be sure. Probably she was human. It wouldn't make any difference. There was nothing he could do through her. Either she was part of the game, or she really thought him mad. Dane tried the window again, but it was hopeless. There would be no escape this town. Buell couldn't risk it. The shock treatment, or whatever Buell would use under the name of shock treatment, would begin at once. It would be easy to slip, to use an overdose of something, to make sure Dane was killed. Well, there were ways of making sure it didn't matter. They could leave him alive, but take his mind away. In alien hands, human psychiatry could do worse than all the medieval torture chambers. The sickness grew in his stomach as he considered the worst that could happen. Death he could accept if he had to. He could even face the chance of torture by itself, as he had accepted the danger while trying to have his facts published but to have his mind taken from him, a step at a time, to watch his personality, his ego, rotted away under him, and to know what he would wind up as a drooling idiot. He made his decision, almost as quickly as he had come to realise what Buell must be. There was a razor in the medicine chest. It was a safety razor, of course, but the blade was sharp and it would be big enough. There was no time for careful planning. One of the guards might come in at any moment if they thought it was taking too long. Some fear came back as he leant over the wash basin, staring at his throat, fingering the suddenly murderous blade. But the pain wouldn't last long, a lot less than there would be under shock treatment, and less pain. He'd read enough to feel sure of that. Twice he braced himself and failed at the last second. His mind flashed out in wild schemes, fighting against what it knew had to be done. The world still had to be warned. If he could escape, somehow, if he could still find a way. He couldn't quit, no matter how impossible things looked. But he knew better. There was nothing one man could do against all the aliens in this world had taken over. He'd never had a chance. Man had been chained already by carefully developed ridicule against superstition, by carefully indoctrinated gobbledygook about insanity, persecution complexes, and all the rest. For a second, Dane even considered the possibility that he was insane. But he knew it was only a blind effort to cling to life. There had been no insanity in him when he'd groped for evidence in the coffin and found it empty. He leaned over the wash basin, his eyes focused on his throat, and his hand came down and around, carrying the razor blade through a lethal semicircle. Dane Phillips watched fear give place to sickness on his face as the pain lanced through him and the blood spurted. He watched horror creep up to replace the sickness while the bleeding stopped and the gash began closing. By the time he recognised his expression as the same one he'd seen on his father's face at the window so long ago, the wound was completely healed. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. They Twinkled Like Jewels by Philip Jose Farmer Originally published in Fantastic Universe, January 1954. Narrated by Tom Trissel. 
Crane didn't get the nightman's name until it was far too late to do anything at all about it. Jack Crane lay all morning in the vacant lot. Now and then he moved a little to quiet the protest of cramped muscles and stagnant blood, but most of the time he was as motionless as the heap of rags he resembled. Not once did he hear or see a Boas agent, or, for that matter, anyone. The pre-dawn darkness had hidden his panting flight from the transy jungle, his dodging across backyards while whistles shrilled and voices shouted, and his crawling on hands and knees down an alley into the high grass and bushes which fringed a hidden garden. For a while his heart had knocked so loudly that he had been sure he would not be able to hear his pursuers if they did get close. It seemed inevitable that they would track him down. A buddy had told him that a new camp had just been built at the place only three hours' drive away from the town. This meant that Boas would be thick as hornets in the neighbourhood. But no black uniforms had so far appeared. And then, lying there while the passionate and untiring sun mounted the sky, the bang-bang of his heart was replaced by a noiseless but painful movement in his stomach. He munched a candy bar and two dried rolls which a housewife had given him the evening before. The tiger in his belly quit pacing back and forth. It crouched and licked its chops, but its tail was stuck up in his throat. Jack could feel the dry fur swabbing his pharynx and mouth. He suffered, but he was used to that. Night would come as surely as anything did. He'd get a drink then to quench his thirst. Boredom began to sit on his eyelids. Just as he was about to accept some much-needed sleep, he moved a leaf with an accidental jerk of his hand and uncovered a caterpillar. It was dark except for a row of yellow spots along the central line of some of its segments. As soon as it was exposed, it began slowly shimmying away. Before it had gone two feet, it was crossed by a moving shadow. Guiding the shadow was a black wasp with an orange ring around the abdomen. It closed the gap between itself and the worm with a swift, smooth movement and straddled the dark body. Before the wasp could grasp the thick neck with its mandibles, the intended victim began rapidly rolling and unrolling and flinging itself from side to side. For a minute the delicate dancer above it could not succeed in clenching the neck. Its sharp jaws slid off the frenzied jerking skin until the tiring creature paused for the chip of a second. Seizing opportunity and lava at the same time, the wasp stood high on its legs and pulled the worm's front head from the ground, exposing the yellowed band of the underpart. The attacker's abdomen curved beneath its own body, the stinger jabbed between two segments of the prey's jointed length. Instantly, the writhing stilled. A shudder, and the caterpillar became as inert as if it were dead. Jack had watched, with an eye not completely clinical, feeling the sympathy of the hunted and the hounded for a fellow. His own struggles of the past few months had been as desperate, though not as hopeless, and... He stopped thinking. His heart again took up the ribbed thudding. Out of the corner of his left eye he had seen a shadow that fell across the garden. When he slowly turned his head to follow the stain upon the sun-splashed soil, he saw that it clung to a pair of shining black boots. Jack did not say anything. What was the use? He put his hands against the weeds and pushed his body up. He looked into the silent mouth of a thirty-eight automatic. It told him his running days were over. You didn't talk back to a mouth like that. Jack was lucky. As one of the last to be herded into the truck, which had been once used for hauling cattle, he had more room to breathe than most of the others. He faced the rear bars. The vehicle was heading into the sun. Its rays was not as hard on him as on some of those who were so jammed packed they could not turn to get the hot yellow splotch out of their eyes. He looked through lowered lids at the youths on either side of him. For the last three days in the transy jungle, the one standing on his left had given signs of what was coming upon him, what had come upon so many of the transies, the muttering, the indifference to food, 
not hearing when you talked to him. And now the shock of being caught in the raid had speeded up what everybody had foreseen. He was hardened, like a concrete statue, into a half-crouch. His arms were held in front of him like a praying mantis's, and his hands clutched a bar. Not even the pressure of the crowd could break his posture. The man on Jack's right murmured something, but the roaring of motor and clashing of gears shifting on a hill squashed his voice. He spoke louder. Seria flexibilitas, extreme catatonic state, the fate of all of us. You're nuts, said Jack, not me. I'm no schizo, and I'm not going to become one. As there was no reply, Jack decided he had not moved his lips enough to be heard clearly. Lately, even when it was quiet, people seemed to have trouble making out what he was saying. It made him mildly angry. He shouted. It did not matter if he were overheard. At any of the prisoners were agents of the Bureau of Health and Sanity didn't seem likely. Anyway, he didn't care. They wouldn't do anything to him they hadn't planned before this. Got any idea where we're going? Sure, FMRC 3, Federal Male Rehabilitation Camp Number 3. I spent two weeks in the hills spying on it. Jack looked the speaker over. Like all those in the truck, he wore a frayed shirt, a stained and torn coat, and greasy, dirty trousers. The black bristles on his face were long. The back of his neck was covered by thick curls. The brim of his dusty hat was pulled down low. Beneath its shadow, his eyes roamed from side to side with the same fear that Jack knew was in his own eyes. Hunger and sleepless nights had knobbed his cheekbones and honed his chin to a sharp point. An almost visible air clung to him, a hot aura that seemed to result from veins full of lava and eyeballs spilling out a heat that could not be held within him. He had the face every trance he had, the face of a man who was either burning with fever or had seen a vision. Jack looked away to stare miserably at the dust boiling up behind the wheels, as if he could see projected against his yellow-brown screen his retreating past. He spoke out of the side of his mouth. "'What's happened to us? We should be happy and working at good jobs and sure about the future. We shouldn't be just bums, hobos, walkers of the streets, rod-hoppers, beggars and thieves.' His friend shrugged and looked uneasily from the corners of his eyes. He was probably expecting the question they all asked sooner or later. Why are you on the road? They asked, but none replied with words that meant anything. They lied, and they didn't seem to take any pleasure in their lying. When they asked questions themselves, they knew they wouldn't get the truth. But something forced them to keep on trying anyway. Jack's buddy evaded also. He said, I read a magazine article by a Dr. Vespa, the head of the Bureau of Health and Sanity. He'd written the article just after the President created the Bureau. He viewed, quote, with alarm and apprehension, unquote, the fact that 6% of those between the ages of 12 and 25 were schizophrenics who needed institutionalizing. And he was, quote, appalled and horrified, unquote, that 5% of the nation were homeless, unemployed, and that 3.7% of those were between the ages of 14 and 30. He said that if this schizophrenia kept on progressing, half the world would be in rehabilitation camps. But if that occurred, the sane half would go to pot, back to the Stone Age, and the schizos would die. He licked his lips as if he were tasting the figures and found them bitter. I was very interested by Vesper's reply to a mother who had written him, he went on. Her daughter ended up in a Bohas camp for schizos, and her son had left his wonderful home and brilliant future to become a bum. She wanted to know why. Vesper took six long paragraphs to give six explanations, all equally valid and all advanced by equally distinguished sociologists. He himself favoured the mass hysteria theory. But if you looked at his gobbledygook closely, you could reduce it to one phrase. We don't know. He did say this, though you won't like it, 
that the schizos and the trances were just two sides of the same coin. Both were infected with the same disease, whatever it was, and the trances usually ended up as schizos anyway. It just took them longer. Gears shifted. The floor slanted. Jack was shoved hard against the rear boards by the weight of the other men. He didn't answer until the pressure had eased and his ribs were free to work for more than mere survival. He said, You're way off, schizo. My hitting the road has nothing to do with those split heads. Nothing, you understand. There's nothing foggy or dreamy about me. I wouldn't be here with you guys if I hadn't been so interested in a wasp catching a caterpillar that I never saw the boha sneaking up on me. While Jack described the little tragedy, the other allowed an understanding smile to bend his lips. He seemed engrossed, however, and when Jack had finished, he said, That was probably an Amophila wasp, Svex unaria, Klug. Lovely, but vicious, little she-demon, injects the poison from a sting into the caterpillar's central nerve cord that not only paralyzes, but preserves it. The victim is always stowed away with another one in an underground burrow. The wasp attaches one of her eggs to the body of a worm. When the egg hatches, the grub eats both of the worms. They're alive, but they're completely helpless to resist while their guts are gnawed away. Beautiful idea, isn't it? It's a habit common to many of those little devils. Scalifron cementarium, Eumenes coaxa, Eumenes fraterna, Bimbic spinole, Pelopus. Jack's interest wandered. His informant was evidently one of those transies who spent long hours in the libraries. They were ready at the slightest chance to offer their encyclopedic but often useless knowledge. Jack himself had abandoned his childhood bookwormishness. For the last three years, his days and evenings had worn themselves out on the streets, passed in a parade of faces, flickered by in plate-glass windows of restaurants and department stores and business offices, while he hoped, hoped. Did you say you spied on the camp? Jack interrupted the sonorous, almost chanting flow of Greek and Latin. Huh? Oh yeah, for two weeks. I saw plenty of trances trucked in, but I never saw any taken out. Maybe they left in the rocket. Rocket? The youth was looking straight before him. His face was hard as bone, but his voice trembled. Yes, a big one. It landed and discharged about a dozen men. You nuts! There's been only one man carrying rocket invented, and it lands by parachute. I saw it, I tell you, and I'm not so nutty. I'm seeing things that aren't there. Not yet, anyway. Maybe the government's got rockets it's not telling anybody about. Then what connection could there be between rehabilitation camps and rockets? Jack shrugged and said, Your rocket story is fantastic. If somebody had told you four years ago that you'd be a bum hauled off to a concentration camp, you'd have said that was fantastic too. Jack did not have time to reply. The truck stopped outside a high, barbed wire fence. The gate swung open. The truck bounced down the bumpy dirt road. Jack saw some black-uniformed boas seated by heavy machine guns. They halted at another entrance. More barbed wire was passed. Huge Doberman pinchers looked at the trances with cold, steady eyes. The dust of another section of road swirled up before they squeaked to a standstill and the engine turned off. This time, agents began to let down the back of the truck. They had to pry the pitiful schizo's fingers loose from the wood with a crowbar and carry him off, still in his half-crouch. A sergeant boomed orders. Stiff and stumbling, the transies jumped off the truck. They were swiftly lined up into squads and marched into the enclosure and from there into a huge black barracks. Within an hour, each man was stripped, had his head shaven, was showered, given a grey uniform, and handed a tin plate and spoon and cup filled with beans and bread and hot coffee. Afterwards, Jack wandered around, free to look at the sandy soil underfoot and barbed wire and the black uniforms of the sentries, and free to ask himself where, 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 where. Twelve years ago it had been, but where, where, where was? How easy it would have been to miss all this, 
if only he had obeyed his father. But Mr. Crane was so ineffectual. Jacky, he had said, "'will you please go outside and play, or stay in some other room? "'It's very difficult to discuss business while you're whooping and screaming around, "'and I have a lot to discuss with Mr.' "'Yes, Daddy,' Jack said before his father mentioned his visitor's name. "'But he was not Jack Crane in his game. "'He was Uncas. "'The big chairs and the divan were threes in his imaginative eyes. "'The huge easy chair in which Daddy's caller, "'Jack thought of him only as Mr.' Sat was a fallen log. He, Uncas, meant to hide behind it in an ambush. Mister didn't bother him. He had smiled and said in a shrill voice that he thought Jack was a very nice boy. He wore a light grey-green Palm Beach suit and carried a big brown leather briefcase that looked too heavy for his soda straw thin legs and arms. He was queer looking because his waist was so narrow and his back so humped, and when he took off his tan Panama hat, a white fuzz exploded from his scalp. His face was pale as the moon in daylight. His broad smile showed teeth that Jack knew were false. But the queerest thing about him was his thick spectacles, so heavily tinted with rows that Jack could not see the eyes behind them. The afternoon light seemed to bounce off the lenses in such a manner that no matter what angle you looked at them, you could not pierce them and they curved to hide the sides of his eyes completely. Mister had explained that he was an albino, and he needed the glasses to dim the glare on his eyes. Jack stopped being Uncas for a minute to listen. He had never seen an albino before, and indeed he did not know what one was. "'I don't mind the youngster,' said Mister. "'Let him play here if he wants to.' He's developing his imagination, and he may be finding more stimuli in this front room than he could in all of outdoors. We should never cripple the fine gift of imagination in the young. Imagination, fancy, fantasy, or whatever you call it, is the essence and mainspring of those scientists, musicians, painters, and poets who amount to something in later life. They are adults who have remained youths. Mr. addressed Jack. You are the last of the Mohicans, and you are about to sneak up on the French captain and tomahawk him, aren't you? Jack blinked. He nodded his head. The opaque rose lenses set in Mister's face seemed to open a door into his naked grey skull. The man said, I want you to listen to me, Jack. You will forget my name, which isn't important, but you will always remember me and my visit, won't you? Jack stared at the impenetrable lenses and nodded dumbly. Mister turned to Jack's father. Let his fancy grow. It is a necessary wish-fulfillment play. Like all human young who are good for anything at all, he is trying to find the lost door to the Garden of Eden. The history of the great poets and men of action is the history of the attempt to return to the realm that Adam lost. The forgotten Hesperides of the mind, the Avalon buried in our soul. Mr. Crane put his fingertips together. Yes? Personally, I think that some day man will realise just what he is searching for and will invent a machine that will enable the child to project, just as a film throws an image on the screen, the visions in his psyche. I see you're interested, he continued. You would be, naturally, since you're a professor of philosophy. Now let's call the toy a spectroscope because through it in the subject sees the spectres that haunts his unconscious. Ha, ha! But how does it work? If you'll keep it to yourself, Mr. Crane, I'll tell you something. My native country's scientists have developed a rather simple device, though they haven't published anything about it in the scientific journals. Let me give you a brief explanation. Light strikes the retina of the eye. The rods and cones pass on impulses to the bipolar cells, which send them on to the optic nerve, which goes to the brain. Elementary and full of gaps, said Jack's father. Pardon me, said Mister. A bare outline should be enough. You'll be able to fill in the details. Very well. This spectroscope breaks up the light going into the eye in such a manner that the rods and cones received only a certain wavelength. I can't tell you what it is, except that it's in the visual red. The scope also concentrates like a burning glass and magnifies the power of the light. Result? 
a hitherto undiscovered chemical in the visual purple of the rods is activated and stimulates the optic nerve in a way we had not guessed possible. An electrochemical stimulus then irritates the subconscious until it fully wakes up. Let me put it this way. The subconscious is not a matter of location, but of organisation. There are billions of possible connections between the neurons of the cortex. Look at those potentialities as so many cards in the same pack. Shuffle the cards one way, and you have the common workaday cogito ergo sum mind. Reshuffle them, and bingo, you have the combination of neurons or cards of the unconscious. The spectroscope does the redealing. When the subject gazes through it, he sees for the first time the full impact and result of his underground mind's workings in other perspectives than dreams or symbolical behaviour. The subjective Garden of Even is resurrected. It is my contention that this spectroscope will someday be available to all children. And when that happens, Mr. Crane, you will understand that a world will profit from a man's secret wishes. Earth will be a far better place. Paradise, sunken deep in every man, can be dredged out and set up again. I don't know, said Jack's father, stroking his chin thoughtfully with a finger. Children, like my son, are too introverted as it is. Give them this psychological toy you suggest, and you would watch them grow, not into the outside world, but into themselves. They would fester. Man has been expelled from the garden. His history has a long, painful climb towards something different. It is something that is probably better than the soft and flabby golden age. If man were to return, he would regress, become worse than static, become infantile or even embryonic. He would be smothered in the folds of his own dreams. Perhaps, said the salesman, but I think you have a very unusual child here. He will go much farther than you may think. Why? Because he is sensitive, and has an imagination that only needs the proper guidance. Too many children become mere bourgeois ciphers with paunches and round O mines full of tripe. They stay on earth. That is, I mean they'll be stuck in the mud. You talk like no insurance salesman I've ever met. Like all those who really want to sell, I'm a born psychologist, Mr. Shrilled. Actually, I have an advantage. I have a PhD in psychology. I would prefer staying at home for laboratory work, but since I can help my starving children, I am not joking. So much more by coming to a foreign land and working at something that will put food in their mouths, I do it. I can't stand to see my little ones go hungry. Moreover, he said with a wave of his long-fingered hand, this whole planet is really a lab that beats anything within four walls. You spoke of a famine, your accent, your name. You're a Greek, aren't you? In a way, said Mr. My name, translated, means gracious or kindly or well-meaning. His voice became brisker. The translation is apropos. I'm here to do you a service. Now, about these monthly premiums... Jack shook himself and stepped out of the mould of fascination that Mr.'s glasses seemed to have poured around him. Uncus again, he crawled on all fours from chairs to divan to stool to the fallen log which the adults thought was an easy chair. He stuck his head from behind it and sighted along the broomstick musket at his father. He'd shoot that white man dead and then take his scalp. He giggled at that, because his father really didn't have any hairlock to take. At that moment, Mr. decided to take off his specs and polish them with his breast pocket handkerchief. While he answered one of Mr. Crane's questions, he let them dangle from his fingers. Accidentally, the lenses were level with Jack's gaze. One careless glance was enough to jerk his eyes back to them. One glance stunned him, so that he could not at once understand that what he was seeing was not reality. There was his father across the room. But it wasn't a room. It was a space outdoors under the low branch of a tree whose trunk was so big it was as wide as the wall had been. Nor was the Persian rug there. It was replaced by a close-cropped bright green grass. Here and there, foot-high flowers with bright yellow petals tipped in scarlet swayed beneath an internal wind. 
Close to Mr. Crane's feet a white horse, no larger than a fox terrier, bit off the flaming end of a plant. All those things were wonderful enough. But was that naked giant who sprawled upon a moss-covered boulder father? No! Yes! Though the features were no longer pinched and scored and pale, though they were glowing and tanned and smooth like a young athlete's, they were his father's. Even the thick, curly hair that fell down over a wide forehead and the panther-muscled body could not hide his identity. Though it tore at his nerves, and though he was afraid that once he looked away he would never again seize the vision, Jack ripped his gaze away from the rosy view. The descent to the grey and rasping reality was so painful that tears ran down his cheeks, and he gasped as if stuck in the pit of the stomach. How could beauty like that be all around him without his knowing it? He felt that he had been blind all his life until this moment, and would be forever eyeless again, and unbearable forever, if he did not look through the glass again. He stole another hurried glance, and the pain in his heart and stomach went away. His insides became wrapped in a soft wind. He was lifted. He was floating. A pale red, velvety air caressed him and buoyed him. He saw his mother run from around the tree. That should have seemed peculiar, because he had thought she was dead. But there she was, no longer flat walking and coughing and thin and wax-skinned, but golden-brown and curvy and bouncy. She jumped at Daddy and gave him a long kiss. Daddy didn't seem to mind that she had no clothes on. Oh, it was so wonderful! Jack was drifting on a yielding and wine-tinted air and warmed with a wind that seemed to swell him out like a happy balloon. Suddenly he was falling, hurtling helplessly and sickingly through a void while a cold and drab blast gouged his skin and spun him around and around. The world he had always known shoved hard against him. Again he felt the blow in the solar plexus and saw the grey tentacles of the living reality reach for his heart. Jack looked up at the stranger, who was just about to put his spectacles on the bridge of his long nose. His eyelids were closed. Jack never did see their pink eyes. That didn't bother him. He had other things to think about. He crouched beside the chair while his brain tried to move again, tried to engulf a thought and failed because it could not become fluid enough to find the idea that would move his tongue to shriek, No! 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 And when the salesman rose and placed his paper in his case, and patted Jack on the head and bent his opaque rose spectacles at him and said goodbye, and that he wouldn't be coming back because he was going out of town to stay. Jack was not able to move or say a thing. Nor for a long time after the door had closed could he break through the mass that gripped him like hardened lava. By then, no amount of screams and weeping would bring Mr. back. All his father could do was to call a doctor who took the boy's temperature and gave him some pills. Jack stood inside the wire and bent his neck to watch a huge black and silver oyster feel the dusk for a landing field with its single white foot and its orange toes. Blindingly, light sprang to attention over the camp. When Jack had blinked his eyes back to normal, he could see over the flat half-mile between the fence and the ship. It lay quiet and glittering and smoking in the flood beams. He could see the round door in its side swing open. Men began filing out. A truck rumbled across the plain and pulled up beside the metal bulk. A very tall man stepped out of the cab and halted upon the running board, from which he seemed to be greeting the newcomers or giving them instructions. Whatever he was saying took so long that Jack lost interest. Lately, he had not been able to focus his mind for any length of time upon anything except that one event in the past. He wandered around and whipped glances at his comrades' faces, noting listlessly that their uniforms and shaved heads had improved their appearance. But nothing would be able to chill the feverishness of their eyes. Whistles shrilled. Jack jumped. His heart beat faster. He felt as if the end of the quest were suddenly close. Somebody would be around the corner. In a minute that person would be facing him, and then... 
Then, he reflected, and sagged with a wave of disappointment at the thought. Then there was nobody around the corner. It always happened that way. Besides, there weren't any corners in this camp. He had reached the wall at the end of the alley. Why didn't he stop looking? Sergeants lined the prisoners up four abreast preparatories for marching them into the barracks. Jack supposed it was time to turn in for the night. He submitted to their barked orders and hard hands without resentment. They seemed a long way off. For the ten thousandth time, he was thinking that this need not have happened. If he had been man enough to grapple with himself, to wrestle as Jacob did with the angel, and not let loose until he had felled the problem, he could be teaching philosophy in a quiet little college as his father did. He had graduated from high school with only average marks, and then, instead of going to college as his father had so much wanted him to, he had decided he would work a year. With his earnings he would see the world. He had seen it, but when his money ran out he had not returned home. He had drifted, taking jobs here and there, sleeping in flop houses, jungles, park benches and fright cars. When the newly created Bureau of Health and Sanity had frozen jobs in an effort to solve the transiency problem, Jack had refused to work. He knew that he would not be able to quit a job without being arrested at once. Like hundreds of thousands of other youths, he had begged and stolen and hidden from the local police and the Bohas. Even through all those years of misery and wondering, he had not once admitted to himself the true nature of his fog-cottoned grail. He knew it, and he did not know it. It was patrolling the edge of his mind, circling a far-off periphery, recognisable by a crude silhouette but nameless. Any time he wanted to, he could have summoned it closer and said, You are it, and I know you, and I know what I am looking for. It is... Is what? Worthless? Foolish? Insane? A dream? Jack had never had the courage to take that action. When it seemed the thing was galloping closer, charging down upon him, he ran away. It must stay on the horizon, moving on, always moving, staying out of his grasp. All you guys, forward march! Jack did not move. The truck from the rocket had come through a gate and stopped by the trances, and about fifty men were getting off the back. The man behind Jack bumped into him. Jack paid him no attention. He did not move. He squinted at the group who had come from the rocket. They were very tall, hump-shouldered, and dressed in light grey-green Palm Beach suits and tan Panama hats. Each held a brown leather briefcase at the end of a long, thin arm. Each wore on the bridge of his long nose a pair of rose-coloured glasses. A cry broke hoarsely from the transies. Some of those in front of Jack fell to their knees as if a sudden poison had paralysed their legs. They called names and stretched out open hands. A boy by Jack's side sprawled face down on the sand while he uttered over and over, Mr. Pelopius! Mr. Pelopius! The name meant nothing to Jack. He did feel repulsed at seeing the fellow turn on his side, bend his neck forward, bring his clenched fist up against his chest and jackknife his legs against his arm. He had seen it many times before in the transy jungles, but he had never gotten over the sickness it had first caused him. He turned away and came almost nose to nose with one of the men from the rocket. He had put down his briefcase so it rested against his leg and taken a white handkerchief out of his breast pocket to wipe the dust from his lenses. His lids were squeezed shut as if he found the lights unbearable. Jack stared and could not move while a name that the boy behind him had been crying out slowly worked his way through his consciousness. Suddenly, like the roar of a flash flood that is just rounding the bend of a dry gulch, the syllable struck him. He lunged forward and clutched at the spectacles in the man's hand. At the same time he yelled over and over the words that had filled out the blank in his memory. Mr. Eumenes! Mr. Eumenes! The sergeant cursed and slammed his fist into Jack's face. 
Jack fell down, flat on his back. Though his jaw felt as if it were torn loose from its hinge, he rolled over on his side, raised himself on his hands and knees, and began to get up to his feet. "'Stand still!' bellowed the sergeant. "'Stay in formation, or you'll get more of the same!' Jack shook his head until it cleared. He crouched and held out his hands toward the man, but he did not move his feet. Over and over, half chanting, half crooning, he said, "'Mr. Eumenes, the glasses! Please, Mr. Eumenes, the glasses!' The forty-nine Mr. Eumene and otherwise looked incuriously with impenetrable rosy eyes. The fiftieth put the white handkerchief back in his pocket. His mouth opened. False teeth gleamed. With his free hand he took off his hat and waved it at the crowd and bowed. His tilted head showed a white fuzz-like hair that shot up over his pale scalp. His gestures were both comic and terrifying. The hat and the inclination of his body said far more than words could. They said, "'Good-bye forever, and bon voyage!' Then Mr. Eumenes straightened up and opened his lids. At first the sockets looked as if they held no eyeballs, as if they were empty of all but shadows. Jack saw them from a distance. Mr. Eumenes, or his twin, was shooting away faster and faster and becoming smaller and smaller. No, he himself was. He was rocketing away within his own body. He was falling down a deep well. He, Jack Crane, was a hollow shaft down which he slipped and screamed, away, away from the world outside. It was like seeing from the wrong end of a pair of binoculars that lengthened and lengthened while the man with a long sought for treasure in his hand flew in the opposite direction, as if he had been connected to the horizon by a rubber band and somebody had released it and he was flying toward it, away from Jack. Even as this happened, as he knew vaguely that his muscles were locking into the posture of a beggar, hands out, pleading, face twisted into an agony of asking, lips repeating his croon chant, he saw what had, had occurred. The realisation was like the sudden, blinding, and at the same time clarifying light that sometimes comes to epileptics just as they are going into a seizure. It was the thought that he had kept away on the horizon of his mind, the thought that now charged in on him with long leaps and bounds, and then stopped and sat on his haunches and grinned at him while his long tongue lolled. Of course, he should have known all these years what it was, he should have known that Mr. Eumenes was the worst thing in the world for him. He had known it, but, like a drug addict, he had refused to admit it. He had searched for the man, yet he had known it would be fatal to find him. The rose-coloured spectacles would swing gates that should never be fully open, and he should have guessed what and who Mr. Eumenes was when that encyclopaedic fellow in the truck had sing-songed those names. How could he have been so stupid? stupid it was easy he had wanted to be stupid and how could the mr humanist or otherwise have used such obvious giveaway names it was a measure of their contempt for the humans around them and of their own grim wit look at all the double entendres the salesman had given his father and his father had never suspected even the head of the bureau of health and sanity had been terrifying blasé about it dr vesper he had thrown his name like a gauntlet to humanity, and humanity had stared idiotically at it and never guessed its meaning. Vespa was a good Italian name. Jack didn't know what it meant, but it supposed that it had the same meaning as Latin. He remembered it from his high school class. As for his not encountering the salesman until now, he had been lucky. If he had run across him during his search, he would have been denied the glasses, as now and the shock would have made him unable to cry out and betray the man. He would have done what he was so helplessly doing at this moment, and he would have been carted off to an institution. How many other trances had seen that unforgettable face on the streets, the end of the search, and gone at once into that state that made them legal prey of the Bohas? That was almost his last rational thought. He could no longer feel his flesh, a thin red curtain was falling between him and his senses. Everywhere it billowed out beneath him and eased his fall. 
everywhere. It swirled and softened the outlines of things that were streaking by, a large tree that he remembered seeing in his living room, a naked giant, his father, leaning against it and eating an apple, and a delicate little white creature cropping flowers. Yet all of this while he lived in two worlds. One was the passage downwards towards the Garden of Eden, the other was that hemisphere in which he had dwelt so reluctantly, the one he now perceived through the thickening red veil of his sight and other senses. They were not yet gone. He could feel the hands of the black-clad officers lifting him up and laying him upon some hard substance that rocked and dumped. Every lurch and thud was only dimly felt. Then he was placed upon something softer and carried into what he vaguely sensed was the interior of one of the barracks. Some time later, he didn't know or care when, for he had lost all conception or even definition of time. He looked up the deep, ever-lengthening shaft of himself into the eyes of another Mr. Eumenes, or Mr. Svex, or Dr. Vesper, or whatever he called himself. He was in white, and wore a stethoscope around his neck. Beside him stood another of his own kind. This one wore lipstick and a nurse's cap. She carried a tray on which were several containers. One container held a large and sharp scalpel. The other held an egg. It was about twice the size of a hen's egg. Jack saw all this just before the veil took on another shade of red and blurred completely his vision of the outside. But the final thickening did not keep him from seeing that Dr. Eumenes was staring down at him as if he were peering into a dusky burrow, and Jack could make out the eyes. They were large, much larger than they should have been at the speed at which Jack was receding. They were not the pale pink of an albino's. They were black from corner to corner, and built of a dozen or so hexagons whose edges caught the light. They twinkled like jewels or the eyes of an enormous and evolved wasp. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. Science fiction and fantasy and horror, oh my!